What does it actually mean? Let's just take deletes on a diesel truck. Does this ruling say, hey, EPA, you don't have the ability to enforce the Clean Air Act because they didn't specifically say a 12-valve Cummins in the Clean Air Act or a 6-7 Power Stroke or an L5P and an EGR and a DPF? Does it mean that that no longer can be enforced either civilly or criminally? Or what does it mean to this kind of narrow focus of the diesel aftermarket performance industry? Yeah. So I'll say a couple things. First of all, today I'm going to be joined by Stuart Cables. He's an attorney that specializes in EPA cases in the diesel industry. And I wanted to chat with him about the Supreme Court's new ruling overturning Chevron deference. There's been a ton of questions. You guys have had questions that I have as well. So I wanted to take a, a deep dive into what Chevron deference is, what has changed with this new ruling, and how it may affect diesel trucks. I'm definitely looking forward to our conversation today. Before we get to it, I want to give a shout out to the team here at the Diesel Podcast. I've mentioned it a few times before, but I'm really proud of them working hard, coming together, and they've they really wanted to focus in on making apparel, t-shirts, hats, mugs, things like that, that reflect things we would want to wear, whether it's about the the truck lifestyle, whether it's about things we enjoy in the outdoors. So we've started Rugged Threads Co. You're going to find a link down below where you click on it, you're going to see a bunch of t-shirts, a bunch of different stuff. And there's so much time and effort that the team put together. And I'm I'm really excited to be able to share it with you guys. So I'm wearing one of our shirts today. It says, keep the shiny side up. There's a ton of other ones. I really appreciate all the feedback you guys have given us. There's been great suggestions for either things you guys want on a shirt or different sizes or different things that you want some of these designs on. So I appreciate all your guys' support and all the the things, uh, suggestions, stuff that you've given to us. So definitely make sure head on um, down to the link down below, check out what we have. Um, Let us know if there's something you want to see if we can help in any way. We're really excited to be able to bring this to you guys. I also want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors that helps make the Diesel Podcast possible. Kershaw Knives has been a supporter of the podcast for a long time. We really appreciate their support. And they have a 40% off MSRP code just for Diesel Podcast listeners. If you go to kershaw.kaiusa.com, use code TDP40. You get 40% off your order, and if your order is over $50, you get free shipping on it. So they have a ton of choices for different opening mechanisms, blade steel, blade shape, different handle designs. So if you need something new for EDC or hunting, fishing, something around the job site, around the house, they've got you covered with a complete lineup of different knives, and they're really designed to meet any budget. So definitely head on over, use code TDP40 if you're in the market, save some money, and get some cool gear. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Stuart Cables, talking about Chevron deference, what the Supreme Court ruling means, and how does it apply to diesel trucks? What does it mean for deletes and being able to modify these trucks? Stuart, welcome back to the podcast. Today is a uh, day I've been looking forward to since it uh, seems like every summer there's a huge Supreme Court ruling, and um, I was looking forward to chatting with you today, getting some guidance on Chevron deference. What is Chevron deference? What does it mean that it's overturned? So welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me, Patrick. I appreciate it very much. I'm always happy to come on. I figured I'd be getting an email from you when <laughs> the case was decided, so I'm I'm happy to be here. I wanted to start, uh, like, what is Chevron deference? Uh, it's a term that maybe not a lot of people have known or they've just kind of heard it the last week or so, but what is, what is Chevron deference? Yeah, so you hear a lot in the news about what it is and what it might be. I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Chevron deference is states that when a law is ambiguous, judges in uh, federal court in particular should defer to the interpretation that is given to a statute or law by a federal agency that's applying the law as long as the interpretation of that law is reasonable. So what that means is, well, I'll just tell you what Chevron said, what the Chevron case was about. In 1977, there was an amendment to the Clean Air Act that imposed uh, extra strict permit requirements on any new or modified major stationary sources. So we're talking about oil refineries, power plants, things like that. And what happened was the under President Jimmy Carter, so this is in the Carter administration, the EPA determined that sources major stationary sources could mean any piece of equipment. Most 
uh, significant factory upgrade would trigger it, trigger a governmental review. So if you have a power plant and you're doing a major kind of update, it gave an agency, the EPA, the ability to come in and say that your update was uh, uh, good update, meaning that it was a legal update and it reduced emissions or you had to redo it or something along those lines. Then in 1981, under the Reagan administration, the EPA changed its course, narrowing the requirement for these major stationary sources to new stationary sources only, not existing stationary sources that were being modified or uh, changed. It would only apply to new power plants or new oil refineries. The National Resources Defense Council, which is an environmental group, sued to challenge the EPA's revised interpretation, saying that the, the interpretation was unreasonable and that they should, that all state major stationary sources should come under this, uh, should, should be able to be uh, reviewed and, uh, and basically supervised uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency. And a U.S. appeals court ruled in favor of the environmental group. So they said this doesn't apply to only state, only new stationary sources. It applies also to existing stationary sources. Okay. That case was taken to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court issued the Chevron ruling the, because Chevron was the party that was getting sued. And what the Supreme Court said was that when a statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to a specific issue, then the question for the court is whether the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. So the agency's interpretation of the statute. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So then... The Supreme Court created a two-step inquiry when interpreting the federal statute. First, they took a look at the statute and the plain language of the statute, and they de determined whether or not the plain meaning or the plain language of the statute could have more than one interpretation. Okay, if it was clear on its face and it could only have one reasonable interpretation, then the court determined that the inquiry was over and that interpretation was the correct interpretation. However, if the statute was ambiguous, the Supreme Court said that the reviewing court, whether it was a lower federal court or a, um, a administrative court or a, the Supreme Court, that they would defer to the agency's interpretation of that statute. So essentially, the Chevron deference required federal courts to give federal agencies the benefit of the doubt when interpreting the federal statutes, okay? In the, the most recent case, do you want me to talk about this one now? Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what... Well, if I step back for a second and make sure I understand. So in, in 1977, the EPA says, hey, you need to follow all these guidelines for all these stations or these oil refineries. And in 1981, they kind of backtrack on it and say, well, it, it doesn't apply to, it just applies to new ones, not old ones. And then an environmental yeah. group says, oh, no, it, it should apply to everything. So by the time it gets to the Supreme Court in, back in the 80s, they say, if it's very specific, with what's directed, you can run with it. But if it's ambiguous, we're going to defer to whatever agency it might be that they're going to interpret it that way. So it's from 1984 to 2024, that's sort of been the precedent is if it's ambiguous, the agency can determine what the law says and then enforce it either civilly or criminally. Exactly. Okay. So it is important to note that just because the Chevron case applied to the Clean Air Act to stationary sources of the Clean Air Act, the Chevron deference was applied to all governmental executive branch agencies. Okay. And it was applied to all, it, it was applied to all federal statutes. So the way that any agency, the IRS, the ATF, the uh, EPA, uh, the Department of Justice, the way any of those agencies was interpreting the statute 
whatever statute was was applicable, they could use the Chevron deference to say, okay, we're going to defer to your interpretation on this. Okay. So then okay. The last week, what, what did that mean exactly? What, what did the Supreme Court really mean for that? Yeah. So last week was the, the case that set aside the Chevron deference is called the Loper Bright case. Okay. And this related to, it didn't relate to the, uh, Clean Air Act. It related to the Magnuson Stevenson's Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976. And basically, what happened was a group of commercial fishermen who regular regularly participate in Atlantic herring fishery fishing sued the National Marine Fisheries Services, which is the federal agency, after the service made a rule that said that the industry it required private companies to fund at sea monitoring programs at a cost of $710 per day. So it imposed this new rule onto a bunch of fishing companies and said that under this federal statute, we have the authority to, to impose the $710 per day. It wasn't a fine really. It was a, it was a cost to monitor the programs to see where the fish are, how many fish are left, whether or not it's safe or reasonable to fish for the fish, um, to to impose this this fee, this seven hundred and ten dollar per day fee. The fishermen sued because they said we don't want to pay this fee, and so made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in the ruling, the Supreme Court overturned Chevron, and it was a six to three vote, which was basically made on party lines. The six conservative justices voted one way. The three liberal justices voted another way. And what the court said is that the Chevron deference was inconsistent with the Administrative Procedure Act, which is a federal law that that sets out the manner and means by which all the federal agencies must follow instructions uh, under the various administrative statutes. OK, which is I mean, it's a little bit complicated and kind of annoying to try to explain. But basically what the court said was that the Administrative Procedure Act did not allow for federal agencies to interpret ambiguous language in the statutes however they wanted. It said that job is either with Congress to clean up the language in the various different statutes and say, this term means X, or this phrase means Y, or it was up to the courts, the federal courts, to determine that a certain phrase or meaning had a certain phrase or meaning, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, the court concluded it remains the responsibility of the court to decide whether the law means what the agency says it means. So basically, if you think about our cases where you have a mobile source, right, and you have a, a term that's defined in the Clean Air Act, say it's a monitoring device, which is which is in the Clean Air Act, but it does not have a specific definition, Okay. The court, not the agency, the court is now responsible to determine what to remove any ambiguity from the language of the statute and determine based on the arguments that are made by the federal agency and the arguments that are made by the law firm or the company that's opposing the federal agency, what that term means, and then during their ruling, assign it a certain meaning. So they've taken the power out of the hands of the agency to interpret certain statute statutory language, and they have put it into the hands of the court. And then the court is responsible to request briefing or explanation or argument from lawyers on both sides who to figure out exactly what these terms mean. Okay. That makes sense. And I'm thinking, <clears throat> thinking of a bunch of feedback and, and stuff that I've read since this happened. And I thought it would be great to maybe get some clarity on it because I've, I saw some that 
said in effect that agencies have no power anymore. And then others have said, it's just been sort of varied. So I really wanted to focus in on that part. So I guess with Chevron deference in this newest ruling and what it does, what does it actually mean? Let's just take deletes on a diesel truck. Does this ruling say, hey, EPA, you don't have the ability to enforce the Clean Air Act because they didn't specifically say a 12-valve Cummins in the Clean Air Act or a 6-7 Power Stroke or an L5P and an EGR and a DPF? Does it mean that that no longer can be enforced either civilly or criminally? Or what does it mean to this kind of narrow focus of the diesel aftermarket performance industry? Yeah. So I'll say a couple things. First of all, under the Loper decision, which set aside deference, the any previous cases that were decided under Chevron are not going to be changed. So you can't go back in time under Loper and say all of these thousands and thousands of cases that applied the Chevron deference, you can't undo those. Okay, so that's the first important thing that you have to know. With regard to your question specifically, the agencies still retain a ton of power. Um, and the most, I guess the best way to explain it is, if you take a look at the Clean Air Act. I'm a specialist, an expert in the Clean Air Act, okay? My expertise is not possibly anywhere close to understanding the entirety of the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act has thousands and thousands of pages, and those thousands of pages have thousands of footnotes, and those thousands of footnotes have footnotes. And there are definitions that apply to everything, things that have been specifically defined and addressed within the Clean Air Act, okay? So the very idea that any federal statute, which is which are usually written by lawyers that are way smarter than me, that any federal statute has is just filled up with ambiguous language is not a, not an accurate uh, thought. It's not an accurate statement. Okay, so the reason that I am bringing that up is because. If you're talking about, if your question is related to someone who, or if your question is related to whether the agencies now have limited power or whether the agencies now don't have the same power that they did have, that may technically be true that they don't have the same power, but there just are not that many ambiguous, ambiguous um, uh, phrases or, or, terms in these statutes in order to apply to uh to which would apply to the chevron deference and especially related to the clean air act and especially related to our cases okay Okay. so let me give you an example you asked about the ramifications as they apply to the um as they apply to our specific the diesel industry and the emissions controls okay? okay Sections 7521 through 7590 of the Clean Air Act clearly state that the EPA has the power to prescribe emissions standards and enforce those standards through civil actions. It gives them that specific authority to do that, okay? It also gives the EPA, the Clean Air Act gives the EPA the specific authority to bring civil actions and impose civil penalties. That's section 7524, okay? The Clean Air Act gives the EPA the specific authority to require testing under the Clean Air Act. So it's written into the Clean Air Act. The administrator shall test or require to be tested in such a manner he deems appropriate any new motor vehicle or motor vehicle engine submitted by a manufacturer to determine whether the vehicle conforms with the regulations. The Clean Air Act 
specifically addresses the prohibition on the use of defeat devices. That's section 7522. I know that your listeners are not going to care what section of the Clean Air Act applies, but I am bringing up those specific sections to draw attention to the fact that the prohibition on the sale of aftermarket defeat devices and the prohibition on tampering is so very specifically defined and outlined in the Clean Air Act that there can't really be any Chevron, any arguments that the EPA went outside of its authority to determine whether or not it was going to enforce on those specific provisions. That makes sense. And I think that's that's where a lot of the confusion <clears throat> arose from. And I'm glad that you gave those specific sections and what they say, because they are very specific. So really nothing has changed with their ability to enforce or to dictate emission standards or defeat devices oh. really at all with this decision. Not with regard to their ability to enforce. It, it would only apply to terms within the statute that are ambiguous as it relates to their ability to enforce. Okay. So with that, I'll give you an example. In section 74113 of the Clean Air Act, there's a term that says any person who knowingly falsifies, tampers with, renders inaccurate, or fails to install any monitoring device or method required to be maintained or followed under this chapter is guilty of a felony. So we're, we're in the criminal world now just for a moment. What is a monitoring device? I've been involved in several criminal enforcement matters recently, which are turned on this specific undefined term in the Clean Air Act. Is the OBD a monitoring device? Is an ECM a monitoring device? Is a TCM a monitoring device? Is an aftermarket module a monitoring device, right? There's no specific definition in there. Yeah. This hasn't made it up to the higher courts yet, so we don't know whether or not Chevron deference would apply. But in these cases, a criminal court, a, a, a criminal judge, or the Department of Justice would have to make an argument that under Chevron, their reasonable interpretation of what a monitoring device is, is either within the scope of the things I just described or outside the scope. In the cases that I've seen, the, the Department of Justice and the EPA, they're not making arguments that Chevron even applies. They're not asking for the court to apply the Chevron deference. They're saying monitoring device has a very clear logical definition and a computer that operates the engine or the TCM or an onboard diagnostic, diagnostic computer. All of those items are monitoring devices by definition. You don't need to define monitoring device in the Clean Air Act to know that that is, the, that is what they are, okay? So they're not asking the court to apply Chevron. And if you're not asking the court to apply Chevron, then the Chevron deference and setting aside the Chevron deference has no impact on enforcement whatsoever. What would be an example of what this does change, either civilly or criminally or what would it change at all as it relates to say epa diesel aftermarket defeat devices you know that kind of stuff is there anything well as far as as far as what we've seen so far it's not going to change anything and it's not going to change the way the epa decides that they want to enforce okay the EPA is making decisions. This is a criminal case. This is a civil case. Um, this is this is a, you know, these types of cases we have decided that we are going to prioritize pursuing. Where I think that this could be helpful to our industry is two places. Number one, if you live in a conservative state, 
if you live in a red state, like for example, you live in Texas, right? A court is going to be much more likely in those states politically to listen to arguments about government overreach and the improper interpretation of the Clean Air Act or any federal statute than they would be in a blue state like Colorado or California or New York. So some of these arguments, I think you could make along partisan, you could make partisan arguments. You could say, oh, I um, am going to, uh, I, I have a case in Texas right now, or I have a case in Florida right now or wherever. I'm, I've got a favorable judge in a rural area of Florida or a favorable court. And so I'm going to start bringing up arguments about emissions and uh, the unreasonable interpretation of the Clean Air Act. And I might be able to get some leverage or some traction in that jurisdiction, as opposed to a jurisdiction in Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, or San Francisco, right? Um, that's That's one way. So if you live in a red state, it is possible, I'm not saying likely, it is possible that you could make some arguments under Chevron, Chevron and, and or the Loper decision, I should say, and the applicability of that, that decision as to what the EPA and the Department of Justice are doing, okay? But again, those courts would have had to apply the Chevron deference or consider or argue for on the lawyer side, the Chevron deference in order for it to apply. I looked into a few cases and like, you, you're a gun guy, I know. Um, there was a recent decision that came down on bump stops, yeah. right? Okay, so in the Sixth Circuit recently analyzed in the Hardin case whether or not a bump stop was a machine gun under the Federal Firearms Act and making it a felony to own a machine gun. And instead of applying the Chevron deference by saying that the term bump stop was not included in the statute or the term machine gun was ambiguous, they just declined to make an art to enter an order which considered the Chevron deference deference anyway. And they said that this would give the agency too much power to make this determination. Okay. So the reason I'm bringing that up in the context of what state we're in and what arguments you can make is that it really does matter where you are. It matters or it can matter. I should say where you are. If you're in a, if you're in a, conservative state that doesn't like government overreach and doesn't like government interference in people's lives, you're going to be able to make more credible arguments in that jurisdiction than you would if you're in a very blue state. Okay. That sort of dovetails into the next way that I think that this is possibly favorable to us, which is that The there's existing cases right now that are going through the process and there's criminal cases that I'm involved in, lots of civil cases that I'm involved in, okay? In these cases, the EPA has made a decision whether or not someone's violation of the Clean Air Act should be civil or it should be referred to the Department of Justice. You and I have talked about this a dozen times on your podcast. What makes it civil? What makes it criminal? And my answer has always been the same. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know what the EPA is doing with regard to their decision-making process of what they refer to the DOJ and what they keep in-house and they make a civil violation. All right? The, the fact that we don't have a clear-cut determination of what makes the case civil versus what makes a case criminal and the EPA will not opine on what decision process they go through on a civil versus criminal that is ambiguous enough in my opinion to attack so somebody gets 
uh, you had uh, Travis Turner on your, your show, obviously, whenever that was, nine months ago, uh, ten months ago. He was uh, charged with a tampering violation conspiracy, right? He pled to a misdemeanor, and he went to uh, prison for, it was supposed to be six months, but it was actually three to four months. Our big argument, and I didn't represent him in the underlying case, but I represented him after he entered his plea. Our big argument in his case was that it was not reasonable that the EPA was enforcing, was doing a civil enforcement for similarly situated companies in his area, and they were doing a criminal enforcement on him. Same exact thing with John Long, who I know has been on your show. And John Long said, when he was on your podcast, he said, I just want there to be some accountability and I just want there to be some consistency. What's criminal? What's civil? Why are you going to ruin this guy's life over here and you're just going to give this guy over here a fine? Yeah. Think that there is a avenue, not for existing cases, mind you, future cases. I think there is an avenue to attack the EPA's decision-making process on what they refer to the DOJ and what they what they keep in house for civil cases. Yeah, that's been a lot of the confusion with a ton of the conversations we've had or topics I've brought up with you is, you know, why does one place that does millions of these things pay a fine and this other small business, you know, get, get a felony for it. Well, just look at the Boeing case, the Boeing, Boeing just entered into a, they just entered into a plea agreement with the department of justice in Seattle. Okay. $347 million fine, a criminal felony for the company, no individual liability for anyone at Boeing. None. And this is in Seattle. So this is in a liberal, a, a, a blue state, a liberal big city, right? Right. Guess what also just happened in Seattle? Tracy Coiteau of RPM Northwest just had a trial there and she was convicted of 12 felony tampering charges and one conspiracy charge. A bookkeeper who owned a company who owned a company that was a that was a dealership that had some deletes on their vehicles why is it that Tracy Coteau is charged with 13 felonies and Boeing has airplane doors blasting off their planes every time you turn around and they're wrecking into the Indian Ocean and you know I could go on for hours and there's not one individual felony charge for that massive company yeah it, it it it's not it, it's not reasonable it's not plausible it's just i think that they're under chevron and again i don't know if it would be strictly under chevron but under the chevron deference i really do think with the new loper decision that there is an avenue to attack the federal agency's decision making process as it relates to what their doing civil versus criminal what makes it civil what makes it criminal are they what's their decision making process look like i could be wrong about that we're at the very beginning of this new frontier for you know uh agency oversight i guess you could call it but it definitely is something that you know bears watching common question we get from you guys a lot is hey i need a diesel engine i either you know i can't wait this long to get one or normal place i get stuff from it it, it just takes too long or i don't they don't have the parts in it that i need maybe my truck's not stock or i tow heavy with it i don't want to go back with just a stock engine dfc diesel is uh, a sponsor of the podcast we worked with them you know hand in hand on doing episodes answering technical questions they have a complete lineup of cummins duramax and power stroke remanufactured engines that are set to a standard of ISO 9001 2015 standards, which is a huge deal in the aftermarket. And there's certain levels of quality testing validation that are required for that. So you know when you get one of those engines, the type of quality 
that's built behind it with an industry leading warranty that's really comprehensive. And, you know, the other thing with that is, you know, sometimes the options that are out there, it's just, it's a basic OEM engine. You want a little bit more. You don't want to have the same failure again. So there's a bunch of different series of engines that they have um, from core um, street tow haul and also the speed of air series which we've covered on the podcast before there's a lot of really cool benefits to it and if you have questions about that reach out to them if you don't know the type of engine that you're looking for if you go to dfcdiesel.com there's a ton of info there you can send an email or you can reach out to them also they're working with speed of air pistons which it's the only piston that pays for itself. And there's a lot of really cool technology behind it. So you can add that into your build and be able to get better fuel economy, um, you know, increase power, increase torque and, and better engine life out of it. Um, you know, some of the most common engine applications or, or, or series of engines that they have with that lead time, a lot of them are in stock or they have really short lead times. So you can check your favorite retailer or, or go to dfcdiesel.com, uh, check them out, see what's in stock, see what you can get. If you have questions, maybe you want to do you know something that's outside of the, the normal series of engines. They have tons of choices for rods, cranks, pistons, valve train upgrades, tons of different things. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure and head on over and check them out. So I guess if I if I was to summarize that the conversation so far is it wouldn't be that this newest case has somehow opened the floodgates and it's like we're back to 1776 or 1785 or 1792 or anything like that. It's more yeah. of I I guess kind of opening almost Pandora's box because it is so soon. But in my mind, with what you're telling me. I just see so many other opportunities for somebody to say, this was an overreach. This was ambiguous. Look what happened. It, it just, I, I think there would be more cases that would maybe get to the Supreme court level where they would have to be more specific as to, you know, what happens. One of the, one of the questions, and I, maybe this is ambiguous, maybe it isn't. If somebody today, it's, uh, I told them we were going to do a podcast about this. And he said, does this decision in any way affect how the EPA can defer to CARB for its guidance and then apply CARB's rules to the other 49 states that are out there? So that's a great question. Um, EPA is not really deferring to CARB. What they're doing is, a, is a, a, I guess you could say that they're, de they're deferring to it, but they're utilizing CARB for convenience as their their early adopter okay so carb was carb engineer was the one who discovered that volkswagen emission scandal when he was doing the testing the mobile testing carb has got many more aggressive uh laws that would apply um it, within the state of california of course and what the EPA does is, you know, they have limited resources, even though it might not seem that way. They have limited resources and they're they're using uh, CARB as a, just a test pilot for what they might want to do nationally. So I don't see a situation where the under Chevron or otherwise, I don't see a situation where CARB, well, I don't think it's possible for the EPA to adopt a strict CARB standard for mobile source emission testing and enforcement because that's not what the Clean Air Act says. And they would either have to rewrite the Clean Air Act or they would have to go directly in contravention to the provisions of the Clean Air Act, which is not ambiguous as it relates to CARB enforcement and CARB regulations. They would have those two statutes in many ways are in direct opposition of each other. The EPA would have to go way outside the boundaries of their authority to adopt CARB as the law, as their as as their um, their interpretation of the Clean Air Act, and I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. A good, the perfect example is. Is a EO required? Yeah. Right. In California, you must have an EO to sell a part in the state of California because it's required by California law. The EPA would have to make a independent ruling to say that you need a CARB EO to sell a part in the 49 
other states. And they're not going to do that because the Clean Air Act does not let them. It's not ambiguous. The Clean Air Act specifically doesn't says you can sell a part as long as it does not increase emissions. You just have to conduct some testing. I think the frustration that I've gotten more so from the business owner side or people who make parts is they feel that when they want to have a part available for sale and want to make sure it's compliant, the EPA hasn't laid for, hasn't put forth a way to do it. And so it's deferred towards this system carb that's existed for quite a long time. So without making a determination or saying, hey, you have to follow carb, it almost defaults to this stricter guideline. And then you have this company, say in Tennessee or Kentucky or Georgia or, or Iowa, having to spend all this money to go through a California process to sell a part outside of that state. So it's not... They don't have to. They don't have to do that. And I've told this to a lot of my clients. What they have to do is they have to have a reasonable basis to believe that that part does not increase emissions. And they have to conduct some testing. Okay? It is very unlikely, not impossible, but it is very, very unlikely that unless a part is a strict delete part, which are illegal across the board, Unless a part is a strict delete part, the EPA is going to enforce on a part that has had testing performed and has and and does not increase emissions. Okay, so I'm whoever, fleece performance or ATS, I build a, a turbocharger, I put it on, it's a bolt-on turbocharger, it doesn't require any tuning. I conduct some testing. My testing comes back as at least as clean within, you know, 10% as the as the factory turbo. The EPA, in my experience, has not and will not waste their time trying to enforce on that turbocharger because it's too much in the gray area for them to care about. They just want to know that you did some testing and you tried to see if it wasn't going to be dirty. So that's why I think that they're not going to impose the CARB regulations on a nationwide scale for exactly the reasons that you were mentioning. It's really difficult to get into SEMA garage to get testing. Almost impossible. It's prohibitively expense, uh, expensive for most companies to acquire a vehicle and then have it tested within all the parameters that CARB and SEMA Garage require. And I don't think that the EPA is interested in going to that level of enforcement based on my many years of, of discussing it with them. I go back to what you mentioned earlier with maybe the clarity that's needed with civil versus criminal is I think from the business side, there's still a lot of risks that they have because they think well, do I want to do my own testing or take it to this place and have them do it and maybe risk a felony off of it or losing my business and and everything else? So hopefully there's there's some clarity with that. There was another question while we're on the topic of parts and this newest ruling. Does it in any way provide any sort of guidance or pathway forward to what is a race part, what is a emissions compliant part? Does this have anything to do with the aftermarket and its production of parts for on-road vehicles? So the EPA is still not enforcing on race parts. True race parts. They're, they're not. Okay. They keep threatening to do it. They keep threatening to say that if your car at any time was a uh, on the road and certified by the EPA to be on the highway, then you can't turn it into a race car. They, can, they continue to threaten to do this. They have not done it. I don't think they're going to do it. And the reason is because of how few actual race vehicles, true race vehicles there are, okay? The EPA's concern has always been that they do not want to say that there is a race exception 
with that's contained within or outside the Clean Air Act, because it is going to open the door to anybody who wants to sell parts and then claim their race parts, right? But I have not seen, and I've been doing this for eight years in depth with the EPA. I have never seen the EPA drive to a racetrack, get on the racetrack and say, hey, Ryan Milliken, you're, what does he have, a Chevelle? Your 62 Chevelle <laughs> used to be on the road. You're under arrest, sir. It's it's just not happening. And, and I feel like the people, this is a pet peeve of mine. I feel like the people who want there to be an exception for race parts don't really want it to be an exception for race parts. I feel they want it to be an exception for deletes that are going on the road. It, you can make race parts. You can sell race parts. You can put them on the vehicles. People do it every day. The EPA is not enforcing on NASCARs and they're not enforcing on NHRA drag race. They're not. So are these race parts or not? That's that's the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the industry itself maybe did itself a disservice way back 10, 15 years ago because they would it was it was the way things were named. It was what they were called. And mm -hmm. it's just gotten grained into the community that uh, that's what they look for. I did think of another question to ask you it has nothing to do with Chevron deference, nothing to do with this case, but it has come up so much since we chatted last. Okay. And it's about and I know we're kind of pressed for time a little bit, so you can give me kind of. Oh, the we're in good shape. We got we're, we're 15 good? minutes until I have to pretend to care about my clients. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is there's been some videos that have floated around, and and I'm sure you know this, but there's federal vehicles that are manufactured by any of the big three, say a 2024 Power Stroke, no EGR, no DPF, but it's for use with the federal government or the military. And then we have the, the vehicles that we can purchase and people see that and they get riled up because they think Ford can make it. It can, it still operates, but I have to buy it with all this stuff on it. Can you explain a little bit about how or why federal vehicles are exempted from all of this stuff or the vehicles that are manufactured for the military or for export to other countries? Cause they're trying to relate it to themselves. And, and I don't necessarily understand the reasons for it, but what is it? Why can they do that? It's the same exact reason that a a soldier in the army can carry an automatic machine gun. The same exact reason that you the army can manufacture a you know a, a, a IC, <laughs> ICBM missile. The same re, the same the same you know you have to, you're applying the weapons logic right like. National security dictates that there not be EGRs or DPFs on those vehicles because it relates to reliability and safety. It's always related to reliability and safety. The government is allowed to do a bunch of things that private citizens are not allowed to do. And that's just the way it is. There, there, there's, no, there's no real artful way to explain why it is that the government is allowed to you know carry around automatic weapons it, it's just they 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 need them theoretically for safety and national defense you you do not see at the local government level local government employees buying deleted vehicles you, they're not available for sale. You can't go to Ford and say, oh, I work for the government. These are national security applications. These are theoretically, I know there's annoying exceptions to the rule, but these are national security exceptions that, that the U.S. government makes, okay? And the way I know that is the EPA, well, the Department of Justice, actually, the Department of Justice loves to see a list of people in the government who are driving illegal vehicles in the federal government. It is like their favorite thing in the world <laughs> because they can get their other friends in trouble, not their friends, their other, the other people working for the government in trouble for violating the government regulations. 
And I have produced as part of criminal and civil cases, lists of government employees that have purchased and are in possession of deletes under the auspice that they are working for the government and they're doing something important and therefore they should be permitted to have a diesel vehicle. And they get into just as much, if not more trouble than anybody else. So the answer to the question is, if you're shipping it overseas, it's not subject to the Clean Air Act, period, end of story. If you are driving a deleted vehicle domestically, then it is akin to a tank or some kind of other armored vehicle. You do not have to have the emissions on there because it's so important that that vehicle be reliable under a public safety or national defense theory that they're just, it's it's an exception to the rule. And people shouldn't get fired up about it because if you want to join the army so you can drive a deleted vehicle, that sounds like a bad trade to me. <laughs> I think that answers, it answers the question, gives some clarity to it. I'm not sure that uh, people you know, are going to be happy with it, but it's, it's something uh, you know, we never really chatted about and it, it popped in my mind to ask you. The other thing I wanted to ask you is earlier this year, we talked about the initiatives changing this year and I'd ask you, Hey, is anything slowing down on your end? And I like to check in on that because I don't, there, there's a huge delay between once something happens civilly or criminally and when like the, the public knows about it, is it something it's still, it's still, you know, going strong. There's still lots of cases, things like that. Has it changed at all on your end or is, it's about the it same? It hasn't changed at all. It's busier. I'm busier than I've ever been. I've got more clients than I've ever had. It is more enforcement than I've ever seen. A lot more criminal enforcement than I have civil enforcement. The, it, it really comes down to what area of the country that you're in. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, Idaho, um, Oregon, Seattle, you're looking at criminal investigations, okay? I'm saying almost no civil investigations come out of there. If you're in Region 4, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, you're looking at uh, you're looking at civil enforcements. I'm saying almost no criminal activity down there. Although I have seen some criminal investigation coming out of Florida recently, but not a lot. If you're in Texas and region five, uh, which goes all the way up to the Midwest, you're looking at mostly your, it's really a mixed bag. It's 50, 50 civil criminal. I've got a case in Pennsylvania right now that's a civil case. I've also got a case case in Pennsylvania that's a criminal case. That's region three. So no, it's not slowing down at all. It's going more than it ever was. There's more people trying to get away with deleting than ever have. And well, maybe not ever, but they're, they're, they're not really slowing down. And so, you know, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that the Department of Justice is going to stop enforcing or slow down enforcement anytime soon. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I think that, um, you know, I guess we'll see with regard to Chevron, whether the Loper case has any impact on the interpretation of the EPA statute, the EPA's interpretation of the Clean Air Act. But I don't see anything changing. I think they're just going to slightly change their interpretation of certain ambiguous portions of the Clean Air Act so that they're not ambiguous. That's that's my prediction. Well, I appreciate you chatting with me today. Once I saw that on uh, on the news, I thought, well, let me let me email Stuart, see when he's available to to break it down for us, help us understand if we're not lawyers and a lot of this stuff is really complex and I'm sure, you know, this could have been a seven hour podcast, but I appreciate you shedding light on yeah. it, helping educate us and giving us some insights into what this meant. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always happy to come on. Uh, If you think of any other listener questions or your listeners want to email or, um, you know, send you a message and I can come back on and I can answer some listener questions uh, that that they might have that could be applicable. 
Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code TDP40 for 40% off MSRP. It's a great way to save some money, get some cool gear if you're in the market for a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site. Around the house, they've got you covered with a bunch of different options for blade steel, blade shape, different opening mechanisms, um, different handle designs, and their whole lineup's designed to meet a ton of different budgets. So no matter what you're looking for, if it's you know, EDC or something to use outdoors, they've got you covered with a complete lineup. And we appreciate them offering that code just for Diesel Podcast listeners. Also, if you head on over to ruggedthreadsco.com, it's a brand new apparel company that we started. We wanted to have some designs on t-shirts that we would wear, like Marin, you know, keep the shiny side up shirt. There's a bunch of other ones there. I'm really proud of our team coming together, some great ideas, putting in the work, uh, the blood, sweat, and tears to be able to make... Uh, you know, not just those designs, but get it on the website, be able to make sure that, uh, you know, we're able to fulfill these things quick. Really appreciate all the hard work. And you guys, we've had a really tremendous response to it. Um, we appreciate the orders that you guys have placed so far and also suggestions for wanting some of these designs on, on different things or even ideas that you guys have. So we're going to have a link down below. Make sure, um, click on over, check it out. Let us know if you have, you know, any questions, any suggestions, and we appreciate your support with it. I also want to give a shout out to some of our patreon supporters tyler lone and 23 diesel um, cutter up rob j cole colby all of our other patreon supporters all of you who subscribe on youtube and podcast apps follow us on social media we appreciate all your support here in year eight of the diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you guys more of the content that you want to hear in 2024 till next time keep the shiny side up